Welcome to Connecting with Coincidence with psychiatrist Bernard David Beitman, MD. Dr. Beitman is the founder of The Coincidence Project. The project encourages people like you to tell each other coincidence stories. To learn more about Dr. Beitman's work, put Connecting with Coincidence in your web browser. You'll find his book, his Psychology Today blog, and the interviews from this podcast. And now your host, Bernard Beitman, MD. Welcome to Connecting with Coincidence. I'm your host, Dr. Bernie Beitman, MD. And we are talking about coincidences. But why coincidence? Why do I use the term coincidence? Well, the reason is that the term coincidence covers two major coincidence forms, serendipity and synchronicity. And it turns out that the people who study synchronicity tend to not pay attention to serendipity. And the people who study serendipity, many of whom are academics, don't pay much attention to synchronicity. But I know from my experience, and I hope other people see it, that rubbing up against each other, that these two concepts, serendipity and synchronicity, have a lot of overlap, and yet they have some differences. And that kind of tension between similarities and differences between the two will help sharpen our understanding of each and therefore of this overall concept of coincidence. Our guest today has tended to use, is tending to use the word synchronicity, but she might use the word coincidence. We'll see how that goes. Uh, Julie Jesperson earned a, major, a master's degree in anthropology at Aarhus University in Denmark based on her thesis the reality of illusion and the illusion of reality. The reality of illusion and the illusion of reality. It takes a while to run that one through. It's, there's a lot in that title. It was an anthropological study of ayahuasca ceremonies, not in South America, but in a Dutch spiritual group. She completed it in 2016. She's a, now a certified hypnotherapist, a soul key therapist and instructor and delightfully has been trained for me in modern shamanism and healing by Danish modern shamans. Julia has worked independently as a therapist performing hypnotherapy, soul key therapy and healing and giving talks and courses on ayahuasca, spirituality and personal development from an anthropological and modern shamanic perspective. She runs the project Portal Journeys with her colleague and sister, Re Jesperson, where they bring groups to spiritual places like the Bosnian pyramids, about which Re has written a book named the Bosnian pyramids. How many of you knew there are Bosnian pyramids in Bosnia? Julia is currently working on a book in Danish about ayahuasca, which is also called Daimi, which is called Daimi in the Netherlands. And she'll probably explain the reason for that. She is featured in a Danish documentary called From the Inside with the journalist Anders Auger with the theme spirituality that will be screened on Danish national TV in the fall of this year. Julie, welcome to Connecting with Coincidence. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure it's having you. You're pleased to have <laughs> pleased to have you, and it was really fun talking with you before we started this. Um, now, you did an anthropological study of daimi of um, ayahuasca, and tell us how it happened that you, from Denmark, found a group that does daimi in the Netherlands, so you could just walk over the border and do something with them instead of flying all the way to Brazil where you couldn't speak Portuguese. And they did their ceremonies in English, so you didn't have to worry about the translation. So I wanna know about how that happened for you. And I think some synchronicities were involved and give us some idea then about who these people are. Yeah, well, Actually, the story also involves the Bosnian pyramids, as you were mentioning before, um, because I ran into my gatekeeper informant in Bosnia um, 
some years before without knowing that he was going to be my main informant. Um, I went to Bosnia just with a friend of mine because she comes from Bosnia originally. I, I went there with my sister to, to visit uh, Sarajevo and, and have a look around and we found out, she told us that there were these pyramids in Bosnia and we got very excited because that was really in our field of interest. So we went out there just for one day to see the pyramids and uh, we were so lucky, you could call it, or you could call it uh, serendipity, that we ran into uh, Dr. Semia Osmanajit, Osmanajit, who is um, the leader of the whole project of excavating the pyramids. Uh, and he is also an anthropologist. And uh, we were allowed to go on his tour inside the tunnels. So we got to talk with him and uh, he got he to thought, sign up. He thought you were one of the supposed research assistants. When, yeah, when, yeah, when you were that, just visitors, yeah. Yeah, we were just visitors and, but we told him that we were anthropologists and he were like, oh, that's so great. Maybe you can help me do this article then. And uh, he had just <laughs> started putting us to work and introduced us to the field archeologist. And we were almost like getting to work there on the spot, but we had to tell him, oh, wait a minute, we're, we're just tourists. <laughs> but, but because we were so lucky to meet him and find out that he found it exciting that we were anthropologists and he would like us to help him, uh, we decided to come back the next year as volunteers. So, so that was the first uh, serendipity there. And then we went back there the next year and volunteered. And uh, there a guy called uh, Johan came one day when I was uh, doing some um, research outside of the tunnels. And he asked me if he could talk to the uh, lead archaeologist. So I, I found that a man for him and uh, I didn't see him anymore. But my sister met Johan again in the evening in the hotel. And, uh, and there they got a really into a really wonderful conversation. And Johan said that he remembered that he thought, oh, he really wanted to meet Rie again, my sister, and talk more because they had really a good connection, he thought. Um, and then half a year later, my sister uh, had um, a gap between her bachelor and starting her, thesis, uh, her master's. So she went to South Africa um, to do some volunteering there uh, on a completely different project. It's called Ubuntu. And she was going to be a, a coordinator of, of some things there. And uh, when she went there, she was being picked up by somebody from the Ubuntu and it was Johan. <laughs> so in South Africa, half a year later, they bump into each other again. And uh, they sp spent then uh, two months, I think, together because uh, there were not so many volunteers. So they really got a good chance to talk and continue this wonderful conversation that had, they had. That, that, that thing of, I've heard this story from a guy from London in South Africa, meeting somebody that made a difference for him. Uh, when you think about that story with how your sister ran into Johan, when, they had a good connection before they ran into each other and he became the person to pick her up at the airport. How do you, how do you conceptualize how that happens? I guess you can relate it to the concept of entanglement that we know from quantum physics, that if you are entangled because you have this connection, then there is an attraction that you, you will attract each other again. That, that could be, if you would look at it from like, how can it happen from an earthly perspective? But maybe there's also um, another part which I could call destiny or something like, like as if you were, yeah, I think this, the fact that I got to make, make this field work was just such a big thing in my life. And it's such a big thing that I'm working, like the whole, it, it set the whole course in my life. So it was so important. So it kind of had to happen if I was supposed to do these things that I'm doing now. <laughs> so. <laughs> Re had but, to meet Johan in South Africa in order for you to do what you were doing. Yeah, she had to do that. Otherwise, I don't know if I, I probably wouldn't have done ayahuasca ever. So. Okay, I didn't get that clear. That that I, I love that I love that part of it because we get 
people often get so caught up, and I have, in, oh, what it means to me, like what it meant to Reed, for example, or what it meant to Johan. Mm -hmm. But sometimes it's just about me, but then it means something for the other person. But here, what it meant to a third person closely connected to one of the two is part of like how I want to think about things. And I hope later uh, we'll talk about how everything's connected, which is something that you came up with from your, uh, your Daimi group, because they, they think that. And I think it's an important question, but I'm interested in how they're connected. Mm -hmm. it's, I think things are connected, but more or less connected. Mm -hmm. uh, we're we'll all breathe the same oxygen. We can do that one. But that, this one, I like to think that your, um, the, the entanglement thing it only is maybe even half right because the quantum particles don't come back together. They get entangled mm -hmm. together and they are separate. But there's no talk about how they come back together again. And I think, mm -hmm. I, th I think there is something established where both people want, and I call it human GPS, where mm -hmm. people find where they need to be uh, without knowing how they got there, because there's something else going on that's subconscious. And I'll talk more about the psychosphere maybe, that I think it goes on in this mental atmosphere that we all are part of, where something like this helps make the connection. When there is a really strong connection on Earth, the psychospheric connection gets stronger and allows for more behavioral connection, like with your sister on Earth. But mm -hmm. you, so she, so she, back to your story, she goes to uh, Johan and they have two months together and then what? And he tells her about ayahuasca and he does some um, cambo, which is another kind of uh, medicine that comes from the Amazon. Psychedelic like? I mean, is uh, it mine? No, it's a, it's a kind of a poison that comes from a frog and you put it through the skin to make the body um, uh, vomit and yeah, get rid of all kinds of toxicity. It's, it's a shamanic treatment that has been developed in order to cure uh, yellow fever uh, oh. and other diseases that, that the Europeans brought to the Amazon. Um, yeah, so, so that is a little related, but it's, yeah, this is much more physical, the Cambo. It doesn't give visions. Uh, so my sister tried this in South Africa and I heard a little bit about it from her, but it didn't sound so nice. It just sounded like hard work. So I thought, okay, uh, now I've heard of this. I didn't pay much attention to that, but then I had to choose a topic for my master's thesis. And I knew I wanted to do something about spirituality in some way, but I, I wasn't sure which kind it would be. Um, and at that time I had begun a little bit to do a meditation and such. So I tried sitting down and asking like, what should I do my thesis about? And then I just heard this voice in my head saying, contact Johan. And, uh, I, I'd only talked with him once on Skype because I was talking to my sister on Skype when she was in South Africa. So I knew who he was and she had been mentioning him, but I didn't know him personally. Um, so I wrote to him and said, hi, Johan, what is it that you're doing in Holland? Because I think maybe it's something I could come and study. And uh, we got into to contact and he asked the, the leaders of the group and they gave me permission to come and do my, my field work there. Oh, that's a great story, especially the voice that says, contact Johan. <laughs> yeah. That, that one, I like that one. I, I mean, I think what that is without is a hint for how things work in connections, that your sister made a, enough of a connection because you're connected with your sister to allow you to know somehow that Johan was going to be helpful to you. And that's, that's the subconscious that is maybe beyond our individual subconsciousness. Mm -hmm. So that's, so that, so there you were, so, you, so you go off to the Netherlands and what happens? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, so I wrote to, to Johan before I went and I asked him, what is it you're doing? He explained that it was Daimi and I thought, oh, okay, that's the same thing as I have once seen a documentary about DNT, the spirit molecule. So that sparked my uh, attention at that point. So I thought, okay, this would be interesting. So therefore I chose to go uh, just with 
I didn't think necessarily that I was going to drink the daimi when I planned the study because I didn't know if I would dare to do so. <laughs> but uh, then after I had handed in my, my uh, first uh, paper about it, then he said that I had to drink it if I wanted to study it. So I had to do that every time I would be in a ceremony. So oh, wow. then, oh, then wow. the decision was made. <laughs> I couldn't pull back at that time. <laughs> so I went to Holland and uh, I... Uh, I met the people there and I did uh, a bit more than three months of uh, field work, 11 ceremonies. And uh, I had so many incredible experiences, both for myself and what I saw that other people were, experienced, uh, were experiencing. And I interviewed people and heard so many fascinating stories there. Um, and I, well, I went home and wrote a thesis about it. One of the parts of your thesis, uh, I think of the second chapter, emphasizes um, the daimi synchronicity connection. Mm -hmm. uh, that you were, you saw a lot of connections. The daimi seemed to do something. And so how does daimi make the participants more likely to experience synchronicity during and after the ceremonies? Yeah, the thing that the participants themselves say is that there is a veil between the physical world and the non-physical world. And when you drink the daimi, it takes away that veil from your third eye. So you can look into this non-physical realm. That's how they explain it. And I, I think that makes a lot of sense, but it's not like that is a, that's a metaphysical explanation for how to understand it. So maybe you could translate it into some other language that would make more sense uh, to, to more people. But it, it, it uh, affects the pineal gland. So because the pineal gland produces DMT, which creates these uh, visionaries, this imagery uh, in our mind's eye. So in that way, we get to see things that are not physically there, but maybe they are there in other ways, because I think some of what we see is kind of projections from the subconscious, but other things are the energy around and in and between people. Like for instance, I was uh, with a guy down there and there was a woman who noticed us, we, like the men and the women are sitting on each sides of the circle. So they are uh, with the distance between them. And she was observing us. And afterwards she asked him, if there was if if he knew me or what was going on because she saw butterflies moving between our hearts during the ceremony so she could see that uh, that energy um and there are so many stories of that 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 you can see uh, the energy moving around so that's not only a projection of your own subconsciousness that is something else because it can be confirmed so many times afterwards by other people because people tend to see some of the same things agreed um i don't think that's a, a metaphysical experience i think there really is that energy and we just don't see it it's like the ultraviolet infrared parts of the light spectrum we don't see it um, but other creatures can and mm. and i feel that energy uh, i i in lots of different ways but on the dance floor is where i have most experienced it and the kind of dancing that i've done with people but there was one time uh, i was looking at the energy between my fingers and they were like green and gold um, bands between my fingers and I could stretch the energy by going like this and then someone came along and put someone came along and put her hand through my hand so I was going like this and she put her hand through my hands and I could it was like the prow of a boat coming through my the energy bands and that was the first time I saw that but more since then I more don't see it I can experience it and uh, I did a psychology today post on energy, like during the um, during the pandemic, you can't hug each other. But I said, how about an energy hug? And they got really mad at me for that because it's not scientific. Uh, and they they started they started like um, 
editing everything I sent them uh, to make sure oh I wasn't being a bad boy anymore. <laughs> uh, so I, I've, I've kind of cleaned up my act for them, but that's what the way current people are about science, about there's, there's no energy between people, but you could see it. And then I could love that there were butterflies between your hearts. That is even better. That, <laughs> that is even better. So it's a, that's, not a meta that's the maybe the third eye gets cleared but that's seeing something that's real on this earth it's not something someplace else hmm. it, yeah it, so i don't know the term metaphysical is that because it's beyond what we currently understand the physical world to be oh or? i see i see that's <laughs> it has a lot of different meanings uh, it's yes i see how you're meaning it it's it's beyond what we yeah okay it's beyond current science is the way we say it accepted reality but what else do you yes you and other people experience uh around the idea of synchronicity i include this energy as part of the synchro synchronicity thing thing i don't know people would argue about that it's not quite the, the same as the usual definitions but it's weird and it's true. That's why I like to include it. Um, but what, what are some of the other synchronicity experiences that you and others had in, the, in, that, in those ayahuasca daimi experiences? Mm. There was one particular uh, story that was very remarkable for me because it included so many different factors that were combined. And that was the story of a, of a guy called uh, Gavin. He uh, came from England to one of the ceremonies that I was also in, in Holland. And um, during the ceremony, at first he was feeling really good, but then the visions he had started to become darker and he got a vision of uh, lungs and he had a feeling that they were cancerous as he explained it. And, and he felt the sickness in the lungs. And first he just tried to explain it away by thinking it was probably because he had caught a cold on the way there because he went down a motorbike. So, so he, he forgot about it. And then he continued on in the ceremonies, in the ceremony. And then he got to look at uh, the, the songbook uh, that the musician on the side of him had where the chords were in. Uh, and he noticed that these court letters were like drifting above the page instead of being on the paper, they were floating in the air above it. And these uh, letters spelled out D A D D A D. And then he was like, Dad? <laughs> and he got to think of his dad, and they had a poor relationship at that point. They were not truly really in contact um, because they held too much resentment towards each other. So he spent most of the ceremony then looking through what had been going on between him and his dad and got to the point where he was ready to forgive him. And after the ceremony, he went back to England and then all of a sudden he connected these two experiences from the ceremony that he had the cancerous lungs and then there was his dad. So he thought, maybe I should call him now. And he called his dad and said, hi, dad, how are you? And he said, I'm, I'm not feeling so well. I have caught some infection in my lung. I can't really get rid of it. And he, he was not convinced that this was the whole thing. So, so Gavin went to visit his father. And when he got there, he could see that he was seriously ill. And the father admitted that uh, actually he he had cancer um, and because Gavin now was there they could they could take up their relationship again and have the chance to like get get these things straight straightened out and settled and his dad even um, accepted that Gavin gave him a healing and um, having this experience that Gavin was able to know that his dad was so ill, convinced his dad that there was something more to it, to life and to death. So that made him less scared of the, the risk that he could die of this. But yeah, that, it's been a while since I've heard from him, but, but the last thing I heard was that he was still alive. Yeah. That's a good one. 
Um, <laughs> and I used to collect stamps. So I, I, I used to, this is like, I collect stories like this about fathers among others. And my father and I had one where he was dying 3000 miles away on, on his own blood, choking on his own blood. And I was choking uncontrollably 3000 miles away. And that's where I got convinced that this, this sort of thing happens. And then another person um, I've talked with um, picked out a book uh, and then was picked up by her father in, one, in a bookstore and then flew to where her father was. And she knew her father from what she read. It was a hint in there that uh, heart attacks can have like burning lungs, again, another lung thing. And her father said, I have burning lungs. And she read that burning lungs could be a symptom. She took him right to the emergency room and they did the bypass surgery on him. Uh, he did have pl blocked arteries. So the ability of the children to pick up stuff like that is pretty well documented by Ian Stevenson in a book uh, he wrote called Telepathic Impressions. Um, and I collect these stories. So what, what you're doing in your, uh, each of your stories so far has been about relationships, in case you haven't noticed. Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> in case you haven't noticed, I, I like to classify coinciders. Uh, and one of them, uh, one of the people uh, is in our group is like, uh, she does relationships. That's where her main coincidences are involved with, although she studies lots of other ones. And you so far are a synchrony, synchronicity. You're, you're a relationship focused uh, coincider. Uh, at least that's mm -hmm. what this looks like so yeah. far. Um, yeah, that's interesting. I didn't think of that. <laughs> Well, now you see how I think. I, 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 I collect patterns. I'm a pattern collector. I love patterns. So it's just fun. Yeah. It's, it's just fun to do it. And especially if they're real. I mean, that makes it even better. My stamp collection wasn't worth much, it turned out, but I like doing it. <laughs> um, so what concepts have you found useful in, your, in the effort of understanding coincidence in the context of Daimi? Yeah, yeah. The things you were asking me before about how you could understand it, like during and after, I did. I didn't get to how you yeah. could use it afterwards, and oh, that please do. relates to what I'm going to say here. Because afterwards, when you have had these experiences of seeing the energy in the ceremony, you know that this exists. So after the effect passes, you know that you still have this energy around you. You're just not able to see it any longer. Um, and also in the ceremonies you experience that you're able to influence other people through your own consciousness and what does that, that mean be, what does that mean that means for instance i had a, a one of my informants he told me about a ceremony where he could see there was a woman on the other side of the circle who was feeling really ill and she tried to uh, release her own negative energy by throwing it onto him because they had eye contact and he could feel that she tried to, she didn't know how to process it herself. So she tried to just project it onto him and he felt it. And therefore he, he said no inside of himself, not showing it, but just in, internally. And as in the moment he did that, no, she started puking because the energy went back to herself. And I've, I've tried that also feeling really ill from another a man that was in the ceremony who was really chaotic in his energy that suddenly make, made me puke even though I was feeling completely fine before he was starting to act up. So <laughs> there's a lot of vomiting <laughs> in these things, but this is, this is just very where it gets really clear that you can affect each other so directly. Also, the first time in my very first ceremony, eh, I was feeling fine until a woman started crying and that suddenly got me down into the deep uh, lower vibrations I so can, in that way you can yeah, yeah. You affect each other well I, I can feel more and more being bothered by just negative energy on on a movie or uh, on television or hmm. just just somebody writing to me something and i've had to learn to be able to like not be so affected by that mm. it's yes. it, and that's not in person that's through media medium mm. do you find that as well yeah so much yeah i just i did it just like 
right before we started here because I, I came to think of a client of mine and then I could feel how she was feeling. I was like, okay, I'm not gonna <laughs> feel that right now. Um, yeah, it happens all the time. So that's also something I, I work with trying to be really conscious of. Yeah, so, so you can learn these things and get to experience this also without ayahuasca, but just it's just in the ceremonies, it gets really clear. So, so when you have these experiences, then you get to know that this is how you, how you interact with each other, also just by how you think about each other. So, so to understand uh, this way of being, uh, I used uh, an anthropological term from Victor Turner, he, who talk, he has studied uh, rituals, rites of passage in anthropology, and he has paid a lot of attention to this liminality uh, period through uh, during a ceremony where you go out of the ordinary and you're in this betwixt and between state where you're not you're not identifying with your own old self and you're not the new person yet so you're in between and you have to be in this betwixt and between liminality phase before you re-enter society and i i think that we can compare the ceremony to this where you have to learn to master this being between the different realities. You learn to master that in the ceremonies and you have to take that, or you, you can get to take that with you outside into your daily life afterwards, where you have to know in your daily life that you are still between these different realities. You can one part of your being is the physical being that is in the physical world and another part of your consciousness is dealing with others in another level of reality and the more you can master being in between and making the links between the non-physical and the physical reality uh, the more synchronicities you get to have and the better you can make use of them do you follow absolutely there's um... yeah. Uh, there's, there's three there's people talk about 3d 4d and 5d uh, dimensions and what you're just describing uh, is being in 4d which is between the fifth and the third where the third is more regular reality and the fifth is um, more out there uh, which is a nice place to get to but it's you kind of lose touch sometimes with the third a regular reality so yes i understand very much what you're talking about uh, what i don't understand is other aspects of being betwixt and between. Um, I, you've, you've described energy, which I'm so glad you did because I know it, it's real. And I, I need confirmation of that uh, because a lot of people don't believe it. And then through the media, you can get it. If you're a therapist, it can be really problematic if you don't know how to manage it. As you get more open, as I have, uh, the people I deal with uh, can get me, um, even through doing it on, on Zoom or something. Uh, so, And there are people out in the world who um, have gotten me where I've had uh, heart palpitations and more because they have hit me with negative stuff. Uh, and I have to be careful about where I go because of that and who I'm around. So it comes out in these physical ways. Probably didn't do it when I was younger, but it, it, it's doing that now. So I want to be open, but at the same time, I need to do these boundary things. But that's energy. Let's mostly what we've been talking about there or the maybe visual things like the that dad thing is a is a change is a step up what are some of the other betwixt and between experiences that you can describe and have had um do you think of during the ceremonies or afterwards i mean uh, during um i mean during the ceremonies and afterwards i mean both but let's start with the let's start with the ceremonies themselves mm -hmm. Um, there was um, one ceremony with um, uh, two people who were uh, in the same ceremony. One of them was called Albert, and he was looking at a third woman during the ceremony. And um, he was looking at her physically with open eyes. And then suddenly he saw that her face started to 
get tattoos that she started to look like a Maori or an Aboriginal with these special kinds of tattoos. And uh, after the ceremony, he talked to his friend who was on the other side and, his, and the, the friend said to him, you know what, I saw this craziest thing, that woman over there, she turned into an Aboriginal. So they, they had both seen the same thing. So they were, they were in this realm of the physical world and the non-physical world blending together. They could see her physically being there, but on top of the physical image of her, they had this tattoo imagery where they both saw that in some way she was related to, to the tradition of the people or however it works. I don't know why they saw it, but there were two people who saw the same thing, that she was a Maori sudden or a, 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 an Aboriginal. I'm not sure which one of these. We have a lot to learn from uh, Aboriginals uh, uh, who walk, who do their big walks. They're mm. always moving uh, in Australia and they're trying to preserve the old culture and they recognize that that white people are infringing on them when Western culture is infringing on them. So it's really a, a good thing to recognize the Aboriginal person coming to here and making, saying, look, we're here and we got something to teach you is what I'm trying to say. And maybe you could do something for us is like, because uh, we got something that needs to be preserved. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that That's, I'm curious to to see about synchronicity and I and ayahuasca or daimi. What could you tell us more about how that works? Uh, you mean more stories? Yeah, I think what you're yeah. saying is these are all synchronicity stories. I the guess way so. You, the way you define it, yeah. Yeah, uh, you know my my informants they just said what an coincidence every time they talk or, or most times because. In the word coincidence, they thought there was implied some kind of randomness and they wanted to underline that this was not random. There was a reason that this happened. So it was either called uh, uh, coincidence or synchronicity, plainly said. Yeah. Yeah, there's a uh, I didn't go through it, but there's a lot of different words people put in front of coincidence. Um, mm. One of and and some of them, some of them are just a coincidence or mere coincidence. Some of it is like an amazing coincidence or a meaningful coincidence. So mm. those are the, those adjectives make a difference. And as you can see, because is it important uh, or meaningful or not as part of the question? Mm. Okay, that that's a good way of uh, yeah being more exact on what you mean. Yeah, that's, that's, that's what I, that's 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 my job, madam. That's what I'm doing. <laughs> that's yeah. what I do. Um, um, yeah, th there is also another story uh, that I would like to tell. And that is something that happened actually after I came home from the fieldwork. Um, I think it was around three or four months after my latest ceremony. So I was like way beyond the effect of the di daimi directly at that point. But one morning I just suddenly had this image. I was lying in bed and I was not used to getting any visions at all. I could get a little bit when I really focused in meditation, but it, this just came completely out of the blue uh, in the morning when after I woke up, I just saw this Native American man with white feathers and a bright golden light behind him. It was and he was radiating this golden light and it was it was so bright and it was so beautiful and it was the most clear vision i've ever had even though i was not uh, under any influence of daimi at that point and i was so curious afterwards to like what what happened here and then i i later i googled uh, native american with white feathers and i found a, a painting and it turned out that this was a, a spirit guide that other people have also been talking about who's called White Eagle. And he happens to be the spirit, the, one of the prime spirit guides of who then became my mentor. Uh, I became an apprentice of her uh, as a modern shaman because we, we had the same spirit guide and I was already, I already knew her, but I, I had no idea that White Eagle looked like this. Uh, I thought it was an eagle. <laughs> But it, it was this man. So I, I, 
and I know that it was because of the effect that the daimi had on me that I became so open that I was able to have this vision, but three or four months later. And then I found out that this person, or this guide was related to, to these teachers. And what struck me even more was then I knew the name White Eagle, so I could find other paintings then when I Googled this. And then I found a paint, another painting of him. And in the background, there was a building and that building was one that I have seen on a drum journey, maybe two years earlier, where I didn't know what the building was, but it was now in the background of the painting of this white eagle. So, so this just connected so much between, like through time. Um, so in that way, it can open you up to seeing such things also much later. And, and I think also be open to like connecting the dots and following the tracks, because if I hadn't Googled it, I wouldn't have known that there was any significance to just, maybe I would just be thinking that I was dreaming. Yeah. That's a good one. <laughs> That's a good one. That's a good one. I, I, I think you're talking about it, but how synchronicity opens people, how Daimi opens up people to synchronicity, but because um, you're just telling us that it can affect you later and later after the ceremony. There's, uh, there's some, I think from what you've written, there's several other ways that Daimi influences people's behavior afterwards as they carry the experience of betwixt and between there no they're between the mystical i'll say it and the, and the regular um, mm -hmm. and they can move to the boundaries of each one of them and maybe in, into deeply into each one of them so what are some of the other ways that that, that experience of bringing it out of the ceremony uh, influences other people's behavior and inc including yours um, I I did some uh, study of this, like how does it change their life world and how and their worldview. And what I found was that people get to have this like inner idea of what is low frequency activities and what is high frequency activities. So people want to move up in frequency towards being happier and healthier and more loving. And therefore they tend to stop doing things that pull them down into more negative uh, mood and bad health. Uh, so in that way, people make a big effort in trying to raise their own uh, mental and physical uh, health. And therefore, they get into a state where they have more energy and they become more aware because they are not numbed down so much by things that can disturb our consciousness in our daily life, like spending too much time in front of the TV or uh, drinking a lot of alcohol and all these things. So they, they raise their consciousness and also they try to, like they tend to become more focused on really doing what is most important and not wasting their time on other things. So you want to seek out, what should I be spending my life doing? And therefore you are also more open to paying attention because you know also that things will show up when you send out, when you have the intention of looking for this guidance, it will show up. So therefore you get to be on the lookout for like what will be the best thing for me to do next so that I can make the most of this very limited time that I'm here on the planet. Mm -hmm. Because in the ceremonies you are, you step outside of the time experience so therefore it feels like when you when you're out there in the eternity and you get back into time you realize that this life is just over like that so don't waste it i don't didn't hear you talking about getting out into eternity until just this moment could you tell us more about that <laughs> yeah i think that's that's part of this experience of the veil that is being pulled apart it 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 seems that it's really, it's like kind of related to the idea of the matrix or that this 
physical world is in a grid, that it's, it's this illusion or dream, this physical reality that is created with some dimension and time is just one dimension that this reality is uh, going on inside. So when, when the construction of this illusion dissolves and you see more clearly into the other, the mystic, the, the bigger picture of what is actually reality, you, you, you have this sense that time, be, time just becomes completely fluid and you, do, you have no idea whether a minute or an hour has passed uh, when that song was being sung. It, it, so it feels like you are in this state and it just takes forever. <laughs> so if you're, if you're in a low point, it's really, really hard to go through because you, it feels like this is eternity and I'm never gonna get out of it. And then it begins to shift and you're so, oh, this is wonderful. I'm eternally gonna be here. And then <laughs> you start to, to learn that, okay, time, time is coming back as the effect wears off and you get more and more into the physical reality again. So that's part of the experience. And, and like, I think almost all people who drink it have that experience of stepping outside of time, or at least that time is being really, becoming a, something completely different, like elastic. <laughs> uh, it's, it's very amazing to hear you talking like that because uh, that idea is around for sure and I've been hearing it, but just to hear another person who's relatively younger talking about this like <laughs> that's the way it is, is pretty amazing to me. So we're, we're having to come to near the end of this, um, I'd like to be able to um, hear you talk about how these experiences have influenced your doing uh, therapy, doing helping people with hypnotherapy and the other therapies you do. Yeah, um, of course, this vision that I had with the with White Eagle was one of the things that led me to pursuing uh, into the spiritual work that I'm doing now because coming out as an academic I thought at first that I was gonna work in that area but there were so many signs that kept pushing me towards engaging more into this and and I feel that this training that I had during the ceremonies in knowing how to handle my own energy knowing how to fill up my myself with my own energy to be more um yeah, to, to be stay more in my own power and not be so affected by others and knowing how to use this energy that is everywhere how to convey it um, it it has just become it I, I didn't see it as that while I was doing the field work but when I look back in hindsight I think it was part of my training as a shaman doing all these ceremonies or training in shamanic work because then later on after I had this vision of white eagle and a lot of other things happened I I became the apprentice of a modern shaman which is a different thing than the traditional shamanism it's it's without substances so it's purely energetic and it's it's um, more down to earth you could say and it's it's uh, just integrated in the daily life here in modern Western Denmark. It's so it's I can sit in front of my computer and have a session with a client over Zoom and use uh, clairvoyancy and do a healing at a distance. And that's that is then shamanic work in the modern sense that that these uh, people that I have been trained they are doing. So I realized afterwards that. That these ceremonies were part of this training, um, and having had all these experiences has really prepared me to work with energy in in this way that I do now. Um, and also, I I work with soul key therapy, and that is about um, regression into past lives and life between lives. and And I've had some experiences in the ceremonies also about uh, past lives. Um, so that I feel that I have a knowing that this is real instead of just a theory. Well, we do have to stop. And uh, I'm, I'm pretty amazed by uh, 
you're like, oh, this is what happened to me kind of thing. It's just like, that's what, it's what happened. Um, and it's almost like you are um, a precursor of what really good therapists need to be able to do is to understand the energy work um, that they can do and we can do and you don't have to be in the same room. I love being in the same room with people. It just, I prefer that as an energy exchange. Uh, mm -hmm. It just makes a big difference to me and to them uh, and they can feel it and they know the difference because there's something happening between us. And so I, I have two people that I can see in person because we, we take the precautions but mostly it's over, it's still over Zoom. Um, but that, that you are tuned into it and that you can affect it, that you understand it, um, the, that energy, and you're developing a greater understanding of it. That is, um, that is really, as we like to say in the old days, really far out and groovy. It's, it's, really, it's really true. Um, you can make a difference and you're, ma and you're making a difference just, just in the way you've told us about this. Uh, and um, I'll tell the person I work with, uh, Julia Trail, about about you and how how really fantastic it is to see what you're what you're doing, Julie. And uh, thank you so much. <laughs> you, you are you're welcome, and um, you you don't get that because very often um, because you you don't talk to people who have some understanding of what you're doing and what you've experienced, particularly. <laughs> A guy like me, you know, an academic, ex-academic, recovering academic psychiatrist um, is, who's been studying this stuff. No, it, it's, it, you are part of a new wave and it's kind of, uh, it's very it's encouraging to me uh, to see that you're thinking this way and that you're a woman doing this. It's like you, 20 years ago, it, that wasn't happening. And you're out there saying, hey, yeah, I do energy. Yeah, I do it over the zoom i can i do it in person i can i can see visions of aboriginals and you know it's just part of the way it it is what <laughs> well yeah it is but other people will know it so you're uh you're a pioneer in this uh and uh it's been a pleasure talking with you and i'm so glad that we were able to meet this way thanks so much been a pleasure for me too so as we like to say in europe Ciao. Ciao. <laughs> this psychosphere is a mental atmosphere, like a hologram of cosmic consciousness.